Okay, so uh, today I'm going to share some lines of interpretation about the intersections between Blake and Stile Liberty, the Italian counterpart of Art Nouveau in Britain. This is a work in progress, so I look forward to your thoughts and comments. I would like to begin with the term itself, Stile Liberty. In Italy, Stile Liberty was initially named Stile Floreale or Floral Style after the peculiar patterns of fabrics and objects designed for the Liberty and Company in London, which was founded by Sir Arthur Lazenby Liberty in 1875. William Morris produced textile patterns and items which adhere to this new style and was a key figure in what, in Britain, became known as modern style or Art Nouveau. Art Nouveau was an attempt of the industrial society to find an aesthetic identity, looking for inspiration in nature and plant forms. The name Stile Liberty of the Italian counterpart thus derives from that of the English company, whose name had become synonymous with the new style. But as we will see, the Italian movement borrowed more than just a name from the British artistic scene. The distinctive features of liberty became the accentuated linearism, the use of asymmetry and decorative elegance. As in Morris's patterns, the line was taken as an expression of strength and dynamism, as a symbol of vitality, an attitude that we recognize in Blake's own work. The intersection of Stile Liberty with artists such as the Pre-Raphaelites and William Morris, whose work reveals an important influence of William Blake, is noteworthy, especially in the conception of space as composed of multiple, all over morphing patterns, in the dominance of interlacing elements, and most forcefully in the aesthetics of the sinuous line. As we see in the frontispiece of Songs of Innocence here, the line blends organic forms, words, and images. In Stille Liberty, as in William Blake's art, concept and form are embodied in the linear undulations of the designs. Architectural historian Giulia Veronesi acutely observes that Blake's forms take on a pure linear undulation, which gives the Pre-Raphaelites a first hint for their inauguration of Art Nouveau. But to what extent did Blake's work influence Proto-Art Nouveau, and how did this new aesthetic mode travel across Europe? Here are some possible lines of inquiry. According to Peter Selt, there is no doubt that Blake exerted a major influence on Art Nouveau, although the fervent feelings conditioned by his visions are not reflected. Self statement, I think, can be better understood if we consider, for instance, the work of British architect and designer Arthur McMurdo, who was also an admirer of Blake and who produced the first work which combined all the characteristics of Art Nouveau, which is the chair designed in 1881 to the right. The back panel shows undulating flowing lines which blend aesthetics and functionality. The ornaments, in fact, while embellishing the chair, also serve the function of purpose of being the back of a seat. The wholesomeness of ornaments and other elements recall here the divine image from Songs of Innocence, where in a similar vein, undulating designs define the layout of the page and frame the typography. Blake's organicity of the page is reflected in the way functional and decorative elements characterize the new style emerging in Britain at the turn of the century. His influence on Art Nouveau emerged especially in the Hobby Horse, a quarterly Victorian periodical founded by McMurdo in 1882. The Hobby Horse was the journal of the Century Guild of Arts and Crafts, a group which was founded in 1880-81 and grew out of William Morris's efforts in the decorative arts. It featured contributions in the arts and designs, but also literature and social issues, offering reproductions of painting and various visual works. Figures such as William Morris, John Ruskin and Walter Crane promoted the authenticity of craftsmanship in an era of growing industrialization with the aim of preserving an approach to the arts 
in the spirit of Blake's own methods. The frontispiece of the first issue shows a peculiar influence of the London engraver, especially in the curving lines of vegetative ornaments around the textual area. Schmutzler notes that it is obviously a pastiche of Blake motifs. Periodicals were an important means of aesthetic influence across Britain and Europe. They offered a place to propose new ideas in the wake of the English arts and crafts as a response to the negative consequences of industrialization, promoting a return to nature. Art Nouveau, with its ornamental and dynamic lines, was an authentic attempt at a life reform. Blake's radical ideas are not carried on in Art Nouveau, a style which nevertheless reflects the behavior of the line and the compositional organicity. The hobby horse contributed to the popularization of the British arts and crafts movement among a European audience, bringing this pioneering aesthetics beyond British borders. International exhibitions and their broad and fascinating environment also played an important role in the reception and development of Art Nouveau abroad. I hope you can still see the presentation here. I am on Leonardo Bistolfi's slide. If not, please alert me. It's uh, signaling some, some, okay, some changes. We so, can see it, Silvia, it's fine. Perfect. Italian sculptor Leonardo Bistolfi, one of the exponents of Stile Liberty in Italy, probably had direct contact with British Art Nouveau in Paris during his visits to international exhibitions, such as the one in 1889. Bistolfi was a leading figure in the artistic movement, and in 1902, he promoted the first exhibition of decorative modern art in Torino. It was entitled Prima Esposizione Internazionale d'Arte Decorativa Moderna and represented the culminating moment of this aesthetic movement in Italy. Bistolfi designed also the promotional poster, which is the one you are seeing now, which showed resemblances with Walter Crane's A Mask for the Four Seasons, especially in the composition and arrangement of floral elements and dancing figures. And here are some of the original photographs of the venue, which was Parco del Valentino in Torino. Not much remains of the exhibition structures and pavilions of the participating countries, but we know that Great Britain was one of them and that the exhibition was an important opportunity of exchange among international representatives of Art Nouveau, including the Austrian architect Josef Maria Olbrich and Walter Crane who was notably inspired and influenced by Blake's art. Blake, wrote Crane, is distinct and stands alone, a poet and a seer as well as a designer. In his work, accordingly, Crane brought together the practical and the creative. While Liberty and Company in London was promoting furniture and objects, in Italy, the spirit of the undulating line was particularly present in architecture. Figures such as Leonardo Bistolfi and architect Giovanni Battista Bossi adopted a similar approach to the conception of organic form in sculptures and apartment buildings. Casa Galimberti, designed by Bossi and built between 1902 and 1905, is an iconic expression of Stile Liberty in Italy, with its facade almost entirely covered with ceramics, painted with floral motifs and human figures on a gold background. In the facade, decorative sculptures and murals frame the windows of the building in the same way that marginal ornaments enrich the engraved surfaces of Blake's work. While in the illuminated books, the text is a means of prophetic message. The windows of Casa Calimberti set the boundary between the private and the public dimension. The balconies are framed by vegetative patterns which treat the window as a body of text. The line here is turned into an expressive element which has an energy of its own, carrying on the spirit of Blake's dictum. Leave out this line and you leave out life itself. 
Blake considers movement an essential part of the line and posits, how do we distinguish one face or countenance from another, but by the bounding line and its infinite inflections and movements? And still a liberty, to a certain extent, embodies this sentiment. We recognize patterns of an aesthetics typical of Blake's illuminated books on paper and carried on through the hobby horse, which promoted an organic, wholesome approach to the arts, where aesthetics and functionalism become one, the way, in Blake's art, text, image and ornaments are brought together. Whether it was about pictorial decorations, stained glass windows, rough iron ornaments or stucco decorations, the artists who adhere to this movement in Italy likewise understood their art as strictly connected to an environment where there was no clear distinction among the arts. Given the large variety of stylistic interpretations, providing a clear definition of stile liberty was a challenge. Art historian Ugo Oietti comes to the conclusion that stile liberty non ha che una definizione, quella di non essere ancora definibile. It has only one definition, that of not yet being definable. Renzo Canella shares similar concerns, but acknowledges a certain beginning of this style. He observes that it started in England by a drapery shopkeeper called Liberty, and it particularly conformed to a line ending in a graceful and elegant curve. So I would like to conclude on this elegant curve, the one we recognize in Blake's work as well as in Casa Calimberti. The vitality of Blake's line is echoed in the aesthetic purpose of Art Nouveau and seems to have emerged in new forms and materials from textiles to objects and buildings across Britain and Italy at the turn of the century. Tracing a genealogy of this elegant curve or linear undulations might be a productive line of inquiry, as well as looking at further exhibitions as a means of Blake and inflections in the Italian Stile Liberty. Thank you.